afternoon. I am Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary here in New York City. Thank you for joining us for another in our series of Just Conversations, where we engage issues of racial lives and socioeconomic inequities intrinsic to our nation and our collective responsibility to create a more just future. Today, I am particularly pleased to welcome to this conversation a 2013 graduate from the Episcopal Divinity School in Cambridge, the Reverend Sarah Monroe. Upon graduating from EDS in 2013, Sarah founded Chaplains on the Harbor, where she also serves as priest in charge. Chaplains on the Harbor are a group of chaplains who seek to build a freedom church of the poor by pastoring, organizing, and empowering the leadership of poor people in Graves, Graves Harbor County in Washington State. In 2013, they also launched Harbor Roots Farm, which hires young people who are in recovery and previously incarcerated returning citizens who are navigating life on the streets. Sarah, welcome and thank you for joining me in this conversation. Well, Dean Douglas, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's great to be with you all today. Well, there's much to cover, so let's jump right in. And let us begin, let me begin by asking you to tell us something about chaplains on the harbor, particularly, what does it mean to be a freedom church for the poor? So we started um, in two, yeah, 2013, I think, with, um, and I started with uh, a vision of just kind of getting to know people and meeting people where they were at on the street. I was a deacon at the time um, in Grace Harbor County in Aberdeen, um, and I started out with a backpack and some sandwiches and just set out to build relationships with people. Um, and then it, at some point, um, about a year in, we were able to, there was a closed church building um, in Westport, which is a small town, about two or 3,000 people, about 20 minutes west, right on the coast uh, of Washington state. So if you look at a map, Grace Harbor County, we're, we're on the peninsula of Washington state. So west, southwest of Seattle, um, right on the ocean. Um, and so there was a small church that had closed. It was an Episcopal church. I was ordained in the Episcopal church. And so um, we asked for use of the building and we just opened it up for uh, people to come in and build relationships with us and eat together. And so I think what we mean by Freedom Church of the Poor is very much um, a couple of different things. One, chaplaincy as meeting people where they're at, wherever their spiritual path is at, wherever they are, um, and particularly reaching out to people who are on the lowest rungs of society. I would say the margins, but it's really, it's really in the United States, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure, I'm not sure they're the margins, I think they're the majority. <laughs> um, and certainly in the places in which we work, they're the majority. Um, and so, you know, opening up for, for gathering together, for worshiping together, for eating together, and, and really started to develop projects of survival. Um, so ways for poor people um, to organize together uh, and, and start meeting basic needs um, with the hope that in that process, we can educate ourselves on, as to why are we poor? Why are people poor and, um, and what we can do about it? So we now run six feeding programs. So there's six feeding programs a week in both Westport and Aberdeen. We have a, a cold weather shelter that's open through the winter um, and do a lot of other outreach, including jail and street outreach um, and uh, providing, just providing support for people where they're at. Yeah, a couple of things stand out. One, providing support for people where they're at. Right, and so it's sort of that, and we'll get more to this later. It's not all about preaching Jesus from that sort of Christian perspective, right? It's doing the work of Jesus' ministry, being that sort of true follower. So you don't have to preach Jesus to, to uh, engage in ministry and do the work of justice. Uh, so meeting people where they are and that people who are struggling for just to survive. So one of the things that strikes me is that you also opened, as I mentioned before, this 
Harbor Roots Farm. And you were very clear. I was looking on that website and you had some job openings and the job description struck me because uh, most of the time we say we're looking for people that have this degree or that degree or have the experience in this. The experience that you preferred was the experience of those who have, are in recovery, the experience of, have, of being a returning citizen from some form of incarceration, the experience of being home insecure, of being on the streets, no one asked for that kind of experience. Talk about that. Why is that important? And you know, what's that got to do with Jesus? Well, I think, I mean, for us, it's central to what we do. Um, I think the, the vision started we uh, through you know, jail and street ministry, uh, a lot of, a lot of our development was asking people like, what, what does this community need? In a lot of, there's there's a lot of young people on the street where we are. I think that that is true everywhere. This is a small uh, rural community. I think the county is like 72,000 people. Uh, Aberdeen's the largest city at about 16, 17,000 people. Um, but one in 16 people are homeless mm -hmm. in Aberdeen. Um, so you have really high rates of homelessness, but you also have, we also, have really high rates of incarceration. Uh, one in 17 children are wards of the state. Um, and that also include, that also means that about the same amount, uh, about one in 17 kids also uh, have gone through the juvenile justice system and often end up in the adult incarceration system as well. And um, in 2015, this has changed because Washington state law has changed and the pandemic has changed a lot of things. But in 2015, Grace Harbor, um, our juvenile justice system incarcerated the highest number of children with non-criminal offenses in the entire country, um, which, which comes out of our truancy laws. Um, so many, so a lot of children are court involved very young. I just talked to a young man in, in jail yesterday and he said his, the first time he was incarcerated was at nine. Mm. Um, and he hasn't, he's been, I mean, he's 25 now and has continued in, 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 the, in the system since that time. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, it, it's really hard to hold hope in a system that like grinds you down that much. Um, and then you get trapped in at such an early age. Right, right. And it just becomes a revolving door. I mean, I should say like, we're working in a majority white community. I think I statistically that. about 85% of Grace Harbor is, is white. Although I suspect that that is a high, higher number than is true because I don't think that it reflects um, large, large numbers of immigrant families that have moved. Um, moved in, but but I think it's important to also recognize um, that you know Grace Harbor is the land and, of the Quinault and Chehalis and Shoalwater Bay tribes, um, and Shoalwater Bay and Chehalis uh, never ceded their land, so we have a very much a presence of Native nations here, and there's also a disproportionate um, a disproportionate amount of this uh, falls on Native people, particularly Native people who end up um, in the cities and in, in Aberdeen and Hoquiam um, and homeless um, and dealing with addiction. Like the, the rates of police violence here can be very high and certainly are disproportionately directed toward, toward Native people and Native children. And also, I think 50% of Black children are homeless in Grace Harbor County. And so, like, um, the, the, the kind of the circumstances that people are facing are dire um, and it can be really difficult um, to find hope in that mm -hmm. um, and to find a path out in that. And I think there's two things that are important. It's important to look at the wider systems, like what, what, what's causing this, right? What the, the, the forces of capitalism and colonialism have as they have played out in this part of the world, right? Understanding that big picture, but also being able to step in in the immediate, in the immediate time and raise up leaders that can actually bring hope um, to the community. And, and the ways, one of the ways that we've tried to do that is by creating an employment, um, employment opportunities for people. Uh, the diocese uh, helped us or the diocese purchased a farm um, for our use uh, just a few years ago. Um, and before that we were leasing property, um, but we were, we, we, Far, a farm is easier to open because it's a small, it's a low capital. <laughs> it doesn't create, you don't need a lot of capital to start. Um, and, uh, and we were able to, to hire people who are just coming off the street or just getting out of addiction or just 
you know, just getting out of jail and prison um, to kind of use their skills and develop their skills. And I mean, amazing leaders have developed uh, out of this. Um, yeah, what's amazing, Sarah, as, as you talk about that is that, you know, I talk about it oftentimes as this sort of poverty to prison kind of pipeline because you have kids that are trapped in this cycle of injury, right? That is poverty. And our response to that as a society has been to build more prisons, to build more jails, right? And, and so your response is to buy a farm, right? Mm -hmm. And so that it's not only a pathway for those who are returning citizens or recovering uh, from the injury that has been caused uh, to them by poverty, but it is can also be a proactive response. Instead of building prisons, let's build, let's build a farm, get a farm or other ways so that we can break in to that cycle of injury. And so my question here before I sort of leave, move to the church is what are we missing? in our society of uh, how do, can we really break in and be preventative, right? As opposed to uh, coming on the back end and then, and also being restorative in terms of justice, right? As opposed to retributive and punishing those people who have already been punished by no fault of their own because they're trapped in a cycle of injury that is poverty and everything that goes with it. What are we missing? I think we're missing a lot of things. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so, answer, so right? the, the, the easy answer, right? The immediate answer is when, when, when a system has developed like this, we're in a post-industrial town, right? Most of the land was, was given to and sold to timber companies um, who developed it, cut a lot of trees and there's not a lot of trees left to cut right this moment. And so like the job, the job situation here is very dire. Um, unemployment rates are really, really high. In Westport, I think the, I think 70% of the population is either unemployed or out of the workforce. So talking about pretty extensive loss of industry. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you're, when you're kind of in that system, especially for young people, I mean, I talk to young people every day who, who just look at me and they're like, I don't understand why my life is such a mess. I don't understand how I got here. I don't understand, like, why can't I make it like my dad did, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's, so, so, so when you're kind of in, in, the, in the midst of that system, I grew up here, you know, I, and I grew up in this community and there's not a lot of opportunity and there's not a lot of hope for what your future might look like. And so the immediate needs, right, are, are, are farms, right? <laughs> you know, or we, we just finally in Grace Harbor County introduced drug court, which is a, a, syst a diversion system that p takes people, you know, off track for prison and, and back into the community and gives them the support that they need. And it really is that simple, right? People are people, people need support. If, if the options aren't there, the cycle's gonna continue. Um, and I think that's the immediate thing. But the long term thing, the theological th question, I think, in this is what are our values as a society? Right. So so in Grace Harbor County and throughout the rest of the United States, if you're down on your luck and for whatever reason you're on the street, if you steal food from Walmart, you're going to go to jail. If you break into an abandoned building and there's a lot of abandoned buildings in Grace Harbor County you get charged with a class B felony, right? And you go to prison, mm. right? So there's consequences for that because we live in a society where property is the supreme value, right? Yes. Private Not property yes, that's right. <laughs> is, is, is what we value, right? That's what our legal system values. That's what as a society we value, right? Native people often say, right? That there was no homelessness before colonization, Right. So we have created a system on stolen land and imposed the system of private property on it. And it values property. If that same guy or gal or person um, ends up dead because they don't have enough food or they died in the cold, which this happens a lot. I bury a lot of people who die for those reasons um, or they overdose or they commit suicide. 
there's no social repercussion, right? Because the, the, there's no value placed on their life. That's right. That's right? right. Nobody, nobody pays if they die. Mm-hmm. Um, because they're, they're, because the value isn't placed on life, it's placed on property. Um, yeah, that, well, sit with that for a moment, right? That we are in a society that values property more than it does human life, human beings, persons, property over persons. So we get stand your ground laws, right? Exactly. Where you can kill people for standing on what you claim to be your property. We're in a society in which we've got plenty of land for people to live on, but we own land uh, to move and steal land, right? And and relegate people to unlivable uh, situations. It's it's stunning to hear you say that a young child will say, why is my life such a mess? Uh, but you can see children at age nine, at age five, and you know where their life is going to end up despite their dreams, right? And soon they recognize that these dreams are, are, aren't, aren't going to come to fruition. So now I ask the question, the church is about presumably Hope. The church is about presumably uh, abundant life and providing the conditions for which people to live. Resurrection, right? Uh, can these dry bones live kind of, kind of world? Yet, I'm struck that during the pandemic, our churches were more concerned with how to have church and thus having debates around worship and liturgy and sacraments, as opposed to being church when indeed the pandemic revealed the dire circumstances of people who already find themselves in dire circumstances of living. I'm struck that you were being church (laughs) and chaplains on Harbor were being church. What, What were your greatest disappointments in terms of the institutional church and what what should or must the church do better? So a couple of months into the pandemic, I was asked to speak with a group of bishops. Mm-hmm. And um, I think there were a lot of topics on the table, but they had invited people who were doing church differently to come talk to them. Um, and I remember sitting there and I remember the majority of the conversation being around whether or not we can offer Eucharist <laughs> by, via Zoom or not. Yeah, I, and I get like I, you know, I went to seminary. I, I you know, I, I know, I, I know that liturgical polity is a thing in the Episcopal Church, and we love to talk about it. But I was struck by how much energy and how much time was being put into that conversation, um, regardless of where you fall on the answer, and the fact that we were seeing record numbers of poor people and communities of color impacted by this pandemic um, in, 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 in ways that are like, we're watching those of us who live in at least regular communities, right? Where poverty rates are really high. We're watching our communities crumble around us, right? Because yes. like locally, for example, a, a lot of the social service provisions and, and just fell away because people People couldn't couldn't sustain them, um, and there's no there was no sustained state or government response to yes. meet people's needs. You know, court dates were being pushed out sometimes months and months and months. People actually have a right to a speedy trial, but they don't under COVID. Right? Prisons, for example, have been hit extremely hard by COVID, um, and not only in terms of like sickness and death, which have happened. Um, but also just um, people are getting moved all over the place. Like people are being locked in the hole because there's nowhere else to put them. People are living in hell in prisons. And so like all of these things are happening socially and we are concerned about <laughs> Eucharist online. And then it, it, was, it was struck me because of course being in the middle of like all of the crisis um, and, then, and then having that conversation was really difficult because you know, the gospel, in the Eucharist matters only because we're remembering, right? Yes. <laughs> we're remembering 
a Jesus who actually lived, who actually was poor and was homeless and, and, and was outcast and like paid for that with his life, paid for his stand against empire with his life. And like, that's, I mean, that was, that was the direction Jesus was facing and like what we, like our calling is to face the same way. And I think it can happen in many, many different ways. It can happen from everything from churches own a vast amount of land and property and yeah. buildings especially and the infrastructure. Church, right? Yeah, the yeah. Episcopal church especially, right? <laughs> and, so, and so what what does it mean to be faithful in that? What does it mean to, what does it mean to live in a, in a world where um, property is valued over life and enact yeah. something differently? Because most churches, I mean, let's be honest, don't, right? Most churches are really proud of their property and really value it oftentimes over their neighbors. Yes. yes. Um, and, you know, and I've seen that happen many times in churches during the pandemic, like right before the pandemic, we had to move churches because the church we were using didn't want to host homeless people because it was too much bother. Um, oh. And, you know, so- just Say yeah, that we, again, a church- yeah. Didn't want to house homeless people. Because, well, not even house. They just they didn't want to host a host program. Because there. it was too much bother. This, this, this is, uh, there was no room for him in the end, right? Right, exactly, exactly. Um, and I think, so I think those are the questions facing the, the church in the United States. And I think, I think it's a, I think it is a question of whether or not we will be relevant going forward and whether or not the church will survive the pandemic intact is, are we, will, will, will we, will we, will we value life over property and will we, um, you know, will we be able to open up what resources we have to be, I mean, people who are struggling, 43.5% of Americans were poor and low income before the pandemic hit. And that's only increased since uh, the pandemic. And, you know, and and I, I, yeah, and I'm so struck of how you talk about, well, I don't know that we want to uh, continue as church as we have been. I like to say to call ourselves church is aspirational. And it seems to me that the pandemic calls us to take seriously this Jesus you're talking about, that, it, that the center of our faith is an incarnate uh, God who was crucified, right? And to I always think of remembering not as sort of the institutional words we remember at the altar, but re-remembering and remembering sort of re-embodying and remembering why we come to the altar in the first daggone place, right? Instead of making the altar so central. And I see that in the ministry that is uh, uh, chaplains on the harbor. I, you know, it could easily be called church on the harbor because that's, (laughs) because you're being church. And as I think of that, Sarah, you started this ministry a year, not even a year out of uh, divinity school. And prior to being ordained, because you were ordained, I think, in 2014. Maybe that says something, right? Prior to being ordained, you started, you understood this ministry. One of the things that we try to focus on at EDS is fostering and nurturing transformative and transforming ministries. You were engaged in one of those ministries. So sort of a two-part question, and that is, what is it that we must do or can do better uh, as we prepare students uh, for ministry uh, and and what can seminaries do in divinity schools? And as well, how have you been transformed uh, by the ministry in which you were a part? Well, I think think one thing is, you know, recognizing, I think, I think there was a, there was a presentation by a, professor at Luther Seminary to the House of Bishops um, a couple of years ago saying that, you know, the Episcopal Church would not function as it currently is in 30 years, um, just just in terms of our rates of decline. And, you know, there's lots of ways to predict the future and none of us are going to get it right. Um, But like recognizing that maybe the most important thing isn't doing what we've always done or doing church the way we're doing church. But maybe the, maybe the question is, is like, how can we be faithful? How do we ask the questions of how can our resources best serve the poorest uh, among us? How can we undermine 
the systems that are death dealing in this country? What does it mean that our churches sit on stolen land, right? What, like really grappling with those questions and grappling with our resources. I think that's part of it. And I think the other part of it is, I think it's important that we prepare people not just to, you know, do church the way we're doing it or like, you know, like the folk, the fo we need to meet people where they are as Christianity declines in the United States as an institution. That doesn't mean people are any less in need of spiritual care. Doesn't mean that people are any less in need of, um, religious leaders that come alongside them and meet them where they're at um, and help them discover, right, what the, what the spirit is doing in their lives. You know, and I minister with people all from fundamentalist Christians to, you know, Episcopalians to, you know, people who are pagan or agnostic um, or really just have no idea where they are religiously. And, and like the goal is not to convert people to some one way of doing things as much as it is to be with people um, as they walk into whatever it is we're walking into next, right? Um, we're, all, we, we're all facing a lot of uncertainty and being open to that uncertainty and be coming alongside people and putting people and their lives and their struggles first, I think is really important. And then the other thing I think that's really important for theological education is to make it practical not just in how to minister to people, but really like, what are we up against in the United States with capitalism and colonialism? You know, what, are, what, what, are, what systems are we up against that really are antithetical to the gospel? That's right. um, and how do we undermine them and how do we work for change? And how do we organize poor people themselves um, to take back their own agency and work for change? And how do we shepherd that movement? Um, and I think that perhaps is where I've been most transformed, right? Is transformed by the people I have met and by the lives that have been lost, mm -hmm. um, by the people I have buried. Um, I really truly believe I have a tattoo where I tattoo all of the names of everyone I've buried, all of their initials um, on my arm under a symbol of, of, of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And mm -hmm. I, I do that to remind myself that there's a cloud of witnesses behind me right, that there's people that um, watch over us now and have joined the company of saints and, and that, that, it's that the change is, change is going to be possible and that we need to, we need to educate and prepare ourselves as much as possible for, for enacting that change in the world. I am so moved by that. Episcopalians don't say amen, but I say amen. Uh, to that and the fact would to thank you for sharing uh, the tattoos because we're talking about people, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about real people. It's just not a number of someone who died. Uh, uh, it is a human being that truly when they were born, this little baby, someone held them and had hopes and dreams for them and they had hopes and dreams. Uh, uh, and so it is a lost dream. Uh, uh, and I'm also struck as you talk about that, and then we'll get to the last question here, that, you know, you have built partnerships with, uh, for instance, the Poor People's Campaign and the Cairo Center, both uh, that are housed here at uh, Union Theological Seminary. And so the importance of even helping our students to connect to programs like that while they're in seminary and taking advantage of those programs and I and how you all are being church, Poor People's Campaign, Cairo Center, uh, Chaplains on the Harbor and the importance of those partnerships. Well, and we've been incredibly grateful to be in partnership with the Poor People's Campaign and, and, and the Cairo Center and the National Union of the Homeless. Yeah, and, and, and that, and, and, and again, it's not about trying to bring people to Jesus, it's, tr it's about doing what Jesus did, meeting people where they are and helping people find pathways to abundant life uh, and, and recognizing them as sacred human beings. Sarah, we could go on forever and I've got so many other questions asked. So this just means we're gonna be in a conversation again uh, because these issues as uh, the poor we will have with us always, unfortunately, as the gospel of John says, and that means that we must always respond uh, and uh, to the poor until we can create a more just world and society. And so I wanna leave with this question, what, does a more just society look like? 
as you stand in the context of being with the people of chaplains on the harbor? So Gustavo Gutierrez uh, says that mm -hmm. poverty is early and unjust death. Yes. Right, that that, that's how he defines poverty and that is certainly how I have experienced it um, in my work uh, is early and unjust death. And so I think, I think the call of the gospel and I think the call for a more just world is the exact opposite of that, right? right? Is that ending poverty means valuing life. It means mm -hmm. creating a world and where life is actually valued. And what that means is a very material reality, right? It's not, it's not pie in the sky. It's not telling people they're valuable, although that's very important. It's, it's enacting a reality where people have a right to their basic needs being met, right? Where, where people have a right to housing and to life and to happiness and to education and development, right? That people have a lot, people have a right to life, that they literally have a right to stay alive. Um, and, and you would be surprised how often the pushback I get is in, in the community um, is, well, actually they have to work for it. And if they don't work for it, they deserve to die. And right, that is the fundamental problem in the American system. And it bleeds very heavily into the church and how we talk about things as well and how we have formulated our theology. And I think the way, the, I think the way toward a more just future is to value life really, truly, materially. Wow, yes, poverty is an unjust death. And if only we could create a society that truly, truly values those who live <laughs> and values life. Thank you, Sarah, Reverend Sarah Monroe for this conversation. And most significantly, thank you for your ministry and your witness this conversation has transformed those of us who have listened and your ministry is transforming life for those whose lives have had no value in this society. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you so much.